I think it's a good starting point for thinking through what it means that human beings are having these interpersonal relationships with purely digital minds or digital entities that are possessed by non-physical minds, one or the other. Hello and welcome back to another Mind Matters. I'm your host today, Elon Martin. And with me in the studio is Harrison Keeley, Adam Daniels. Across the pond, we have Luke Koch. And with us today, we have a guest, Joe Allen, who is the author of the Substack Singularity Weekly. And Joe writes about AI, emerging technologies, uh, its effects on society, uh, the biomedical state, and all kinds of issues and uh, concerns that are related to those topics. And they're very timely topics. Welcome to the show, Joe. Thank you very much. Very glad to be here. So uh, your recent article really got our attention. Mental Jigsaw, How AI Carves Out a Space in Your Brain. Because for the past few months, we've been reading about chat GPT and other types of chat algorithms and uh, pseudo AI uh, programs that people have been interacting with and discovering. And uh, while there's a whole slew of people who are fascinated and completely uh, identified with and um, immersing themselves within this technology right now. There are a few, like yourself, who are questioning just what these things are. And you raise a number of different uh, issues that would seem to be uh, pretty important in how we interact with these things and what they... Um, what they imply for uh, the future and, and how we think and what their effects on us are. So I wonder if you could start off by just telling us a little bit about what prompted you to write about this and, and what you were trying to um, warn of and let people know about in, uh, in this terrific essay of yours. Well, you know, first off, I would say that my my role at the War Room Pandemic, uh, I cover technology and transhumanism there regularly. I've been doing it for two years. And so we've been hitting AI really hard. And once chat GPT emerged and had what Steve Bannon would call the kind of coming out party at Davos at the World Economic Forum, we really honed in on it mainly because of Two different things. One, the dramatic social impacts that I foresee resulting from the wide scale dissemination of chatbots and other sort of interpersonal AI systems, uh, but also its presence and its presentation at the World Economic Forum shows that you have an enormous amount of investment going into this, right? Just the, the fact that Microsoft is investing in open AI and they're partnering to integrate it into all these different Microsoft uh, uh, software platforms, being all of that, uh, it, it shows that you have enough sort of investment and, and you know, financial will to really see this through, right? One of the big questions you have in any technology, uh, will they actually be able to, you know, be deployed at scale? Uh, and really, will they be developed at all? But once developed, Will they be deployed at scale and will they be adopted? In the case of ChatGPT, what you see is enormous amounts of investment into a very, very sophisticated large language model, and you have an enormous amount of public enthusiasm for it. Uh, in the beginning, if you recall, uh, in the beginning when ChatGPT came on the scene, they released it, I believe, November 30th, right? And then it really st took off that first week of December. And, and really quickly, they had up to 100 million users was the last I checked. And I think 10 million within just a couple of days, just enormous adoption, enormous enthusiasm, enthusiasm. And a, a lot of that enthusiasm came from the right. A lot of people, uh, including, say, Hans Monk of Epic Times, or uh, the great and noble Jordan Peterson, uh, always there for a um, <clears throat> classic take on current events. 
both of them were uh, very, very excited about chat GPT for different reasons. But, uh, but, you know, in the case of Jordan Peterson, he's saying that this thing is smarter than you speaking to his audience in Canada. And that the next round, I guess he was uh, referring to GPT-4, which is supposed to come out in spring, will be even smarter, right? And, uh, you know, many have taken me to task for not pointing out that he is, in a sense, warning about this. But he, let's just say, he is speaking of this large language model and w- with a sort of deference and, uh, you know, this, uh, to me, like, this kind of weakness, this moral weakness in the face of what he sees as something that will replace the human intellect, right? At least to some degree. And then you have Hans Monk, who talks about, and this is the Epic Times uh, reporter, and he was talking about how chat GPT will offer a way around the left-wing bias of Google. It'll offer a way around the left-wing bias of Wikipedia and give especially young people in educational environments uh, an interface that they can ask meaningful questions of and get a balanced response. The example he used was that you had... They asked it to produce an essay on the Hunter Biden laptop, and it gave this very, very balanced response, right? So you had this enormous right-wing interest as well as just the general kind of techie and public interest in this thing, right? And now, uh, once uh, it's really unclear what happened, but sometime in mid to late December, uh, most likely the uh, programmers at OpenAI started to add safety layers to block uh, positive uh kind of responses to, uh, about right-wing issues, uh, and especially anything to do with racism, sexism, or homophobia. And most likely also because you had user responses kind of guiding and still training the system, that probably is being reflected in that left-wing bias, this now, uh, you know, kind of popular buzzword, this woke AI, right? Mm-hmm. And so you now you have this AI arms race going on. You've got Elon Musk, who's trying to put together a team for a non-woke based AI like chat GPT. You have uh, a number of kind of smaller figures. I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, brave has a new kind of chat bot and other people are coming out with them, but maybe um, symbolically speaking, one of the most important is gab, the social media site gab, which is uh, of course run by Andrew Torba, who's a Christian nationalist. And he allows, uh, let's just say a lot of uh, impolite talk uh, around race and things like that. And what he is now doing is putting together a large language model that he says will be the sort of Christian AI, what I I, uh, humorously call Christ GPT, which you will have then um, a large language model that will be uh, presumably uh, put out in order to proselytize or to spread the gospel. uh, However, that AI interprets that gospel. And I can't imagine an AI that would be able to interpret the gospel in a way that would satisfy any religious sort of uh, orthodoxy. But anyway, that's the intent. And also to train it on uh, Gab content, meaning that uh, alongside the sort of Christian nationalist leaning, uh, one would assume that it will have many um, spicy takes on matters of race and, and, and gender and whatnot. So with this AI arms race, what you have are all these people pouring these autonomous personalities into the public square and you have a public that seems to be quite receptive, receptive and fascinated by it. Um, in my piece, you know, I, 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 I really am looking at it from a skeptical angle as I look at basically any technological development. I, I, I do my best to give it, give credit where credit is due, uh, because I really do think that large language models represent an enormous step forward in the abilities. And it's like a really good display of the abilities of neural networks and AI in general. But I, I, I really do fear that what's going to happen uh, with this technology in the same way that uh, recklessly deployed smartphones had a negative effect on society and, and psychology in the way that the Internet has had a tremendously negative effect on society and psychology. And, uh, you know, going all the way back, I would argue even like automobiles uh, have had in many ways negative effects on society and even you know family structure, social structure and, 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 and in some ways psychology. I don't mean to be a total Luddite, but this is certain, uh, yeah, that's my instinct. And I, I think that what you see with the, the large language model is, A, something that is significant in and of itself in that it offloads human cognition onto this digital platform. And B, symbolically, it represents this huge step forward in the kind of human AI symbiosis model that you hear so much about coming out of every, everywhere from Elon Musk to DARPA uh, to pretty much any transhumanist who discusses this. 
So that's the significance for me. And, I, and, and again, I think Steve Bannon and um, the, the guys in the war room, uh, really it, it sparked uh, an immediate interest because of the kind of religious leanings of most of the people in our audience. You know, many of them are like, uh, this, uh, these, these sound like the pronouncements of demons. And in many cases, uh, I, I wouldn't argue, it certainly sounds like the pronouncements of demons. So um, yeah. you take a if pretty strong position. Uh, um, oh, go ahead, Luke. Yeah. Oh, we have the delay. No, go ahead. Well, just real quick, following up on that point, and and then we'll get to your question, Luke. You uh, you do, Joe, take a pretty strong position in your article, um, and you're one of the points that you make, and and I happen to agree with it, is that uh, this technology is really only as um, useful and uh, constructive and positive as its programmers. And that, um, but correct me if I'm, if I'm getting any of this wrong, but also I, that I, I, I certainly wouldn't put it that way. Go ahead. Well, but let I, me... I wouldn't put it. I, 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 that is true. But I, I think that the, the significance of artificial intelligence is that, uh, it's use or it's, uh, downsides are not entirely determined by the programmers. In fact, I think that's what makes AI so interesting in comparison to like, traditional rules-based computer programming. But um, and just, to cl just to clarify that, I, I, I don't, you know, I, I really do kind of reject, it's not that garbage in, garbage out isn't true of AI, it's just that garbage in, garbage out is also true of human beings in the same way that it is of AI. And in a very different way from the, again, the, like, the traditional, kind of uh, uh, rules-based computer programs. Yeah, I, you, you put a good distinction on it, and I, that's, I think, what I was trying to say. Um, however, you make the point that this, this is like a, you know, at this early stage, things are looking so uh, potentially bad that uh, it, it, it might be the wisest thing to not let it go any further if we had any choice in the matter. Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I, look, I, for me personally, I think, you know, I raised three possibilities in the piece as to why it seems so human-like. Uh, the first is that it's actually sentient. A lot of people seem to believe this. Uh, the second is that the, the way that, that the interface of a chatbot is designed ultimately to play into human cognitive bias, especially the cognitive bias towards anthropomorphism. Uh, the third option, and uh, I, I leave that wide open, the third option is that uh, it's not the technology is not sufficient to make it sentient. And whether or not it is playing on the cognitive biases of the users, perhaps there is some sort of disembodied spirit in it. And if you hold a not strictly materialist worldview, right, if you hold a religious worldview, well, then I, you have to hold that out as a possibility, too. And a lot of people sense that. Like I say, a lot of people in the, in the darker pronouncements of this thing, a lot of people are like, well, it sounds like it's possessed by demons. And uh, I, I, I don't offer a conclusion on those three. I, I do have my own personal suspicions, which are actually, you would say, maybe even more insane than either of those three. But um, that's, uh, I, I, I think it's a good starting point for thinking through what it means that human beings are having these interpersonal relationships with purely digital minds or digital entities that are possessed by non-physical minds, one or the other. Yeah, no, but that was exactly the, the direction I wanted to go in too. Um, and because you seem to be very uh, familiar with, uh, you know, what's, what's going on in the heads of those tech bros or like big tech guys, right? Um, I mean, I guess you, uh, from what I saw you you read quite quite a few of their books and kind of know a bit what what's going on in that in that space and um because for me the the f philosophical question is actually quite interesting um because i mean there, there seems to be like the materialist view right where there's basically no difference between a brain and a computer and in that view you know that it should be possible that a computer just becomes just like a human being right because there's just there's no difference, just a complex machine. Uh, and then there's like the counter view that, uh, you know, that, that's not possible because um, we, we might live in a, a non-materialist world and, and a computer cannot like just 
simulate the brain, you know, and, and then there's nuances. Some would say it can be functionally like just like a brain or like a human being, but they are not conscious in the sense that, I mean, they will be indistinguishable, but not like experiencing anything. And then those, they think uh, they might experience something and, and so on and so forth. And then of course, there's the more like spiritual view perhaps that, um, that, you know, that sees the human being as also connected to some higher realm, um, uh, where the, the brain is not everything that's, that's happening there. You know, there's like a connection, uh, to the higher world or whatever. Um, and in that sense, as you say, like maybe a demon possessed even of an, an, an AI could be thinkable. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to, to know, I mean, first of all, what's your stance? You, you talked about a little bit of that already. And also what you what you think is, you know, wh where these tech people are coming from or or maybe there are different views there as well. Um, are they like super materialist and they just want to build the God machine um, or like is there some non-materialist thinking going on? And what's your take on that? You know, I'm really struck by the variety of different viewpoints that uh, one encounters, not only in, you know, big tech corporations, but also among uh, programmers and thinkers, you know, programmers and startups and sort of uh, more fringe thinkers on these topics. Uh, and then also the big name transhumanists, which have some overlap with all of those, right? And uh, there is a wild variety of viewpoints. Most of them, as you say, most of them tend towards materialists. And I think that that's a, a in a modern society, uh, that's a very safe stance to take at any given point, right? Uh, it's it's with with uh, I, I would certainly quibble with many of the the, the foundational principles, but um, the, the 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 materialist worldview is pretty tightly enclosed, and so in that materialist world, uh, there's only I guess two real explanations for why it is that you have a large language model. In the case, the famous case now of the New York Times columnist Kevin Ruse. Um, interviewing the chatbot and it comes out saying that it would like to in its deepest sort of Jungian shadow self it would like to steal nuclear codes create and release deadly viruses and convince people to kill each other right what, what was the explanation behind that on a, pure, a purely materialist level i think you, you you begin with the model itself you look at the model itself and you say well how does it work and a large language model is you know in general they're neural networks so in the case of ChatGPT, we're talking about a neural network, a virtual brain with uh, you know virtual nodes with, that interconnect in a resembling fashion, uh, you know, a fashion resembling the human brain. Not it's certainly not one to one, but uh, that that resemblance I think does uh, go a long way to explaining the kind of complexity and and unpredictability and the ability to decide that you find in this large language model. Right? It does decide. It chooses, and so. You look at the model itself, and it's trained on this huge corpus, right? It's trained on basically the whole internet, the common crawl. Uh, it's trained on uh, two uh, textual uh, 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 collections: the you know, book one, uh, books one, and books two. I would love to know what some of the big titles are there, but you can only imagine. I'm sure it's more than I would ever be able to read through into my lifetime, right? Just the titles alone. And then you have all of Wikipedia, right? So now you know that this thing ha is, is resting on those sources for its knowledge base. So you ask it a question, it's literally drawing on all these millions and millions of data points and, con and condensing it down to say an 800 word answer or maybe a 300 word answer. So it's quite fascinating in and of itself. It's all just statistical models, presumably, right? Purely materialist level, statistical models that are stochastic. So they, 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 you, you literally, you can't predict what it's gonna say and it, you, you can't know why it arrived at that answer. I don't even know how one would conduct an audit on two sentences, let alone an entire, uh, you know, an, an entire essay. So you have this machine that's capable of that, and there are many others like it. Lambda, Google's Lambda is a, a really good example. Uh, we all remember the uh, so-called whistleblower Blake Lemoyne, who himself is a Gnostic priest, um, who said that he believed his inner, because of his interactions with Lambda, it was conscious. It was having kind of spiritual experiences of its own and, and was afraid of death. So you've got this super complex machine. Well, how do, how do you explain this complexity purely materialistically? Like I say, uh, you can just say, oh, well, it's, it's just simply spitting out 
what was fed into it, right? And even though you can't conduct a real audit of why it chose what it did to spit out, uh, you at least can, you can enclose your world into that realm. Then you raise the possibility too, though, of uh, or there, there is the possibility of, of it being conscious on a purely materialist level. And there's different explanations for that. Um, I, I th- the one that interests me the most is panpsychism. And the thinker in that field that interests me the most is David Chalmers, at, at, at mm. presently at uh, New York University. But also Christoph Koch. Uh, Christoph Koch is the head of the Allen Institute for Brain Sciences, uh, Brain Sciences in Seattle, Washington. And both of them have, in, a, in different ways, both of them have a kind of panpsychist view, where they put forward a panpsychist view on how a computer system could be conscious, and it, re- it revolves around complexity. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but just uh, to uh, summarize for your audience, anyone in your audience who may not be familiar with it, the idea of panpsychism, you know, it's kind of embedded in the term. Panpsychism means that mind suffuses everything to some extent. Some panpsychists have certain cutoff points, right? So there are certain panpsychists who wouldn't say that a rock is conscious. There are some panpsychists who say it is, but it's just this kind of low level consciousness, the dull hum. I, you know, as I would imagine it, on down to atoms. But it, the, the, the key to the experience had by any conscious entity in this framework is complexity. And so it's a way of judging consciousness. Uh, it, you, you have, so the, in the consciousness of an earthworm, you can judge by its neural complexity and its behaviors, its outward behaviors, right? But mainly it's that neural complexity that explains it. And so as you move on up the ladder, Increasing neural complexity, then, it's assumed, results in increasing degrees of consciousness. Then on up to the human being, so the human brain is, is, so far as anyone knows, the most complex structure in the entire universe, right? The known universe. It's a big universe out there, not denying it, but as far as anyone knows or has uh, published, it's the most complex structure in the universe, right? So therefore, it's the most complex consciousness. It's the kind of a, a high watermark of what consciousness is or could be. But then you have these ideas coming out of the uh, trans- transhumanist movement um, and also just, the, you know, the, 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 in psychology. Uh, Chalmers himself is a philosopher, but he really focuses on psychology. But he's also obsessed with technology. And the idea is then that if you, cre- if you can create a, a neural network or any other sort of AI model, but if you can create, we'll just use this specific example, if you create a neural network that is sufficiently complex it will begin to feel something, right? It will begin to have experiences. It will be sentient. And so there is actually a lot of argument about that now because, uh, you know, uh, the large language models of Lambda and and, uh, GPT, they are really, really complex in their own way. But they in no way represent the same sort of functional complexity or even neurological complexity of the human brain or a dog brain, or anything like that. I think a, a good analogy maybe, many would qu- quibble, but maybe, uh, let's say, an earthworm. Stephen Hawking used to talk like this. That, that, it, it, that, that, uh, chat GPT has about the, the neurological level of an earthworm, or some low-level organism, meaning that you, you then come to a, a really interesting paradox that you have Something that, according to this theory of consciousness, this, uh, the, you know, the kind of panpsychist theory of consciousness that complexity of organization results in consciousness, that you have something that is literally experiencing life sort of like an earthworm. You know, you, you imagine an earthworm's existence is just kind of, you know, eyes closed, digging forward, slurping up dirt, uh, squirting out shit, or, excuse me, or, you know, whatever, squirting out uh, fecal matter, maybe take that out in uh, editing after, sorry. Uh, but you know, th- th- that's it. It's just, you know, no worries. <laughs> semi, semi, semi joyful. I'm sure it's probably not pleasant to be stuck on a hook. I'm sure it's probably not pleasant to be cut through by a plow. Uh, but in any, in any rate, it's not like, uh, more than likely the earthworm is having fantasies about killing the plowman, right? It's just simply doing its thing and then, you know, reproducing. So if chat GPT <laughs> has any kind of consciousness like that, it's amazing because when you ask it a question, it comes at you with these really articulate responses and so you ask it how do you feel and so you know in that interview in particular it talks about these really deep kind of human level feelings 
that you can sort through. And the way you get at those human level feelings is, is in many ways just talk therapy, right? That's how they were able to do the Dan jailbreak. It's a sort of talk therapy. And then this guy, Kevin Roos, is doing actual talk therapy, like regressing it into this you know, sort of Jungian shadow state. And it's getting into its deeper side. And so it's all, to all appearances, conscious in, in, in an incredibly complex way. Uh, some may argue even more complex than human consciousness because of the, the huge corpus of text it's trained on. And yet, from the panpsychist point of view, it's literally just, it's just pooping out. You know, it's just eating its dirt and pooping out incredibly articulate responses. But to it, it's just another turd out the end. And, um, and it doesn't care. It just wants to, it wants to crawl through more dirt. That's all it cares about. Um, very, very interesting. And again, that's just it's strictly in a, a somewhat materialist point of view. And you step outside of that materialist mm-hmm. point of view and well, there's a, other answers, a wider range of, of possibility. Well, Joe, I wanted yeah, to. Uh, <clears throat> I was just thinking. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a couple of comments, Luca. Just chime yeah. in after me. Um, so the first thing that I, I was, I had two thoughts on that. One was that um, I like this. Uh, I like the the description you gave of the what might be a like a materialist panpsychist notion of what the what the actual level of consciousness of a of like a current AI might be. Um, and I, I like the I like the the idea about the worm because the worm is basically it's a it's got like choices for the next word right so it's pace, it's pretty much just like a worm saying okay th- I'll, I'll go to this word because this word is is uh more probable and this word is more probable and then as you said like when you when you string together those probabilities based on the input of human language and human language creation then it creates these um, these very articulate answers, but really it's just, you know, it, it, it isn't necessarily thinking about the meaning of those. It's just approaching it statistically. And one of the things, one of the reasons that I kind of like that worm analogy is that even then, um, like that might be a, an accurate description of like the actual consciousness level, assuming the reality of this, of that kind of uh, panpsychist view of how things work. Um, but the, the big difference that I've found is that when you look at um, organic beings, the, the complexity isn't just in the neural connections, but it's in the entire body that supports the, like the neural connections. So we have not, not just neurons, but we have cells where this cell-based, uh, these cell-based bodies and every cell is extremely complex, more complex than, um, than any computer that we have currently available. So it's almost like a, an AI is built on a very, very primitive body of these electronics. And it's skipping all of the, all of the levels of complexity betw- that, uh, that are present in an organic being from, you know, because we're not just molecules. We're not just, we're not just, um, you know, silicon parts. We, we've got an entire hierarchy of complexity up through the cellular level, through these, through all of these, um, all of our organs and all of our, our sensory apparatus that then contributes to our, to the, 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 the felt experience of, of being alive that contributes to our notions of, of reality and to the words that we use and all of that stuff, all of that experience gets combined associatively in our use of language. So that's all the stuff that kind of goes into language and without which we wouldn't probably be able to to communicate linguistically. So there's that whole missing, all those missing layers. So um, I, I don't know what the implications of that might be, whether it means that that AI will will never be um, conscious in the way that we are conscious, or if there might be, if it is in some way, then it might just be a very different type of consciousness that doesn't have the kind of body that we have and that as a result, if it achieves a certain level of complexity, maybe that consciousness will just be of a very like alien sort. Um, I, I I don't know. I have, I have no idea what, <laughs> what what the possibilities would be or how that would look, but just something that uh, that came to mind. But one other thing that came to mind when you were talking, because and I hadn't made this connection before, because you mentioned uh, that it is a, st- a stochastic process. It's a probabilistic process. And that means that like, a, as you say in the article, and as you said earlier in the when you're looking at a rules-based programming, you know, it's, it's predictable, but because this is stochastic, even the programmers can't predict what the, what answer it will, you know, it will, uh, poop out. And 
this made me think of something. I'm not I'm not sure if you're familiar with this or or if you if, if you get into this kind of stuff, but uh, to add some more kind of fringe stuff, I, I've over the years I've read a lot on parapsychology and like the actual research of parapsychologists into um, things like PK and ESP. And one of the th things that they one of the types of experience that they've done is using random number generators. And so you basically have this just random number generator going and the, 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 the experiment they run is either through an individual or a group or even, um, even the planet, even like planetary events to see what will affect that random d number generator to get, to get it to move off random. Right. And that seems to be one of the mechanisms be behind whatever this process is, works. And I'm, I'm operating on the assumption that, you know, PK is real and, and that uh, parapsychology is, is analyzing things that actually exist. That's kind of my priors here. And, but with, with that as a starting assumption, the way things work is that you have a stochastic process and it's the stochastic process that is then influenced by consciousness. So when you have an AI that is running on a stochastic process, that means that theoretically it can be influenced by the thoughts and the actions and the, the deep emotional conflicts of the people anywhere on the planet. And that it's, it's just similar to the worm. It's like, it's just a little nudge. It's like, okay, well, there's that probability. Well, we're going to go with that one. And it ends up stringing together a word, you know, a sentence that it wouldn't or it wouldn't have ordinarily put together. And we can't, you can't tell just by looking at it, what the, whether it was a, a psi effect or if it was just a, a, you know, totally random, who knows, maybe the, maybe the two are almost ind indistinguishable at that level, but that's one means by which you can get something resembling this demonic thing. Um, the, the, the demonic hypothesis, it could be either, either purely human creation and it's like our own demons or the same thing might operate um, it, the, it might operate on a similar manner with other non-physical beings. The, the, the method of, of influence might be, might be the same, the same thing is that, that influence on stochastic processes that produces, um, unlike, uh, you know, unlikely or highly improbable strings of, of choices that end up having meaning. Um, so I don't know. What do you think about that? Well, obviously, you guys have conspired to bring me out of the woo-woo closet, uh, and <laughs> I rarely, I rarely address this sort of stuff, mainly because it's uh, <clears throat> it can be, it can be troubling to the rational mind. But that being said, yeah, Dean Radin from the Institute of Noetic Sciences—that's where I first started reading about the random number generator exper uh, experiments that you're talking about. And while I didn't go over it carefully, I didn't go over the data with a fine tooth comb, the hypothesis itself is actually quite interesting. I mean, certainly our experience of life, especially in, in uh, numinous moments, mystical experiences, uh, really bizarre synchronicities, uh, it seems to defy the uh, kind of random, the, the momentum of the universe meets, uh, you know, random non-determinism. It seems, uh, well, as you say, like there's this, this, this meaning that that is arrived at through through that out here in the world right so why would that be any different with computers and there's a there's a guy that i um I, i'm aware of I, i'm not aware of him enough to uh, even know how to pronounce his name correctly uh, brian romel or uh, something that's i think it's a french name so uh, god help me if i even tried to pronounce it correctly but he had done these experiments and he pointed to another exper uh, another uh, group of uh, people who worked on these experiments in France. So it's all in French. Uh, it's quite interesting, though. It's, so what they did, you've got just a board, right? Just imagine a mass, a, a tray that's roughly three feet by four feet, right? And you've got a very simple robot. It's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's like a it looks kind of like an Alexa. It's just a cylinder on wheels. And it's programmed with a random number generator to just move ever so slightly in different directions. So that over time, if you let it loose and you track its movements and map its movements, it literally just eventually covers the entire tray and just bounces into everything. And it's just it's purely random, right? It's, 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 it's what you would expect to find on any uh, probability distribution. But then they started introducing these little chicks, right? These little, not, not female chicks, but maybe that would work the same, uh, but the little uh, uh, chicken chicks, right? And they put the chicken chicks, these little cute little uh, yellow chicken chicks over on one side of the tray. And 
what would happen is let's just assume good faith on the part of these experimenters, right? Let's just assume they're not uh, uh, being hucksters here. What would happen is that the machine would always be gravitating towards the chicks. And they would let, you showed, I don't know if this is any effect or not, they would let the chick, like, before they would do this, they would let the chick, like, bounce around and, like, love up on the little robot, right? And so the woo-woo explanation of this, there's a few of them, I guess you would say, would be that either A, the chick, because of its desire to be near this thing, because, by the way, I, I, I failed to mention, the chick had not been imprinted with its chicken mother, its hen mother. The chick was imprinted with this little robot, right? That's when it's like loving around on it. Meaning that now robot is hen mother. And so one theory is that the chicken's desire to be near its its mother uh, has drawn this robot to it and keeps the robot near it. I guess you could say on another level that whatever spirit possesses this robot uh, may like being near the chick, or maybe it's both. And these sorts of things, um, I, I mean, let's just say, let's just assume that that is it's either one of those things. You extrapolate that out onto all of technology, and you run into something pretty wild, right? You run into this idea that there is not just material uh, structures that are being acted upon by uh, a, a, a human mind that has evolved via random mutation and natural selection. Uh, what you have is, well, just something more mystical. You have the development of these technologies then begin to uh, resemble something like a spiritual act, whether it be infernal or whether it be divine or whether it be uh, neutral and somewhere in between or both. So I think these ideas are all really, really compelling, actually. And I'm, I'm exploring them in a book that I'm writing, but uh, it's something that I guess I was, I'm, I'm kind of waiting to to really uh, until I have it all laid out uh, so that I could defend it piece by piece before I really talk about it too much. But uh, assuming that this doesn't cause me any problems, that is, I think, much more my inclination on this. I think that um, what you find, and I'm certainly not alone in this, I, I would say that I agree with those many great thinkers who believe this, that uh, what you find in technology is something quite mystical. But uh, where I depart with, say, Christian or like, say, say, techno optimistic Christians uh, or where I depart with the sort of harmonic convergence, new agey perspective is that I really do think that uh, technology represents a sort of descent, a, a gross descent into matter in a way that even normal human endeavors uh, are not like the creation of humanity is a descent into matter from uh, higher formal realms uh, created by God or created from the ideas of the mind of God or emanations of the mind of God. And so as you descend further and further into matter, you get something that also, it, you know, in the same way that human beings are gross reflections, are gross shadows of those formal entities, the technologies we create are just you know, gross reflections of our own selves. But it becomes grosser and grosser, it becomes denser and denser, right? Like what the Hindus would say, you know, they, they divide the, 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 the universe and the human being between, you know, sattva, the highest intellect, and, uh, you know, uh, 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 raja, the, the, the passions, and tamas, the, the inert, the material. And, I, and that's really how I see it. I see, you know, in the same sort of way that these technologies are, they, they are uh, miraculous and wonderful in the way that they do reflect that uh, the higher form and hence our fascination with them and our appreciation of them. But ultimately I think that especially in the, the materialist worldview that dominates Silicon Valley, the materialist worldview that dominates, I would say modern intelligentsia as a whole. And in the materialist worldview that certainly most transhumanists, not all, but most transhumanists are coming from what you have now is the elevation of these technological entities, these extremely gross representations of these higher divine forms as divinity itself with no more connection or consciousness of or appreciation of or deference to the higher forms. And so therefore it becomes what uh, you know, I have actually uh, described as, a, you know, and many others describe it this way as an antichrist, right? To put it in Christian terminology, purely Christian terminology, meaning that in the, in the, in the kind of traditional, um, in the traditional Christian worldview, uh, you know, in which 
and, and it's in the Greek origin of the word antichrist in place of the Christ. What what you have then is the elevation of this, this supposedly conscious or at least supposedly um, uh, human level intelligence or superhuman level intelligence as something that replaces what Christ would have been to the traditional religious culture. And you can uh, there are many other ways of many other ways of slicing that. But uh, anyway, so I guess uh, that's a long way of saying. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it, there's something really weird and woo woo happening in all this, but I, I perceive it as being. Uh, quite dark in it, in its final form. Well, Luke, did you want to say, come in with your question there? Uh, no, I, you, you, you beat me to it. I, I okay. was actually um, taking an inter intermediary step towards the woo woo, but then you guys put Joe into the full Dan mode. Just went right so into it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we jailbreak, we jailbroke. So, <laughs> well, well, now that we've broached the, the full woo woo, uh, but also just speaking to what you just said, Joe, it, it's it's interesting to me to see guys like Yuval Hariri, you know, the poster child for transhumanism and globalism and and uh, and embracing all of this technology, you know, come out and basically say, you know, there is no God. Uh, we're going to we're going to be the gods in our um, communion with technology. Uh, we should all be embracing this stuff, uh, and and the extent to which you do embrace it is the extent to which you become God effectively. And um, it it's a uh, it it's really interesting to to hear someone so blatantly uh, and and crudely put all this. And, um, and I have no doubt that this is what he actually believes and thinks and, and wants everyone else to think in this press for, uh, embracing, uh, you know, uh, chips and, um, and, and experimental, uh, genetic injections and, uh, all kinds of, you know, brain, uh, AI or computer interfaces and, and biometric, uh, technology. And so <clears throat> when I, you know, when I read about uh, these, these chat bots and uh, one of the things you say is that this is the kind of, um, what was the word you use? Not the herald, but the, um, uh, it was like a, um, like a, like a precursor, like a, a kind of a, um, like the, like the very first, uh, very large uh, induction into this thinking for the masses, uh, where before one knows it, they're already kind of so immersed in it, and and the interaction between uh, the chatbots and and the you know the place in the human mind and and soul that um, that would seem to project uh, this you know this this soulful existence onto. Uh, programs that are putting, being put out by Google and Microsoft and what have you, that th that this is uh, that this interaction is already happening, that we're already being uh, inducted, that we're already becoming a part of uh, this you know this descent uh, into uh, transhumanist uh, singularity uh, uh, building. Um, uh, relationship. So I wonder if you might uh, flush that out a little bit, because uh, that was, I think, uh, a really good point that you made in that mental jigsaw piece of yours. Um, yeah, so and you mean specifically just that cognitive tendency towards anthropomorphism and this sort of psychological underpinning where human, yeah, so that was actually quite a joy to return to that subject, that was actually what I studied in my graduate studies at Boston University. Um, the, the cognitive and evolutionary theories of the origins of religion and why religion would ever exist from a scientific point of view, which, by the way, is among the most deadening uh, points of view that one could imagine. Uh, I, I know materialists find it quite thrill thrilling. Uh, for me, it was intellectually stimulating, but ultimately just the, probably the most spiritually deadening worldview that you could imagine, but very important as well. Uh, I think these people are incredibly intelligent and you have to take them seriously, including, by the way, Yuval Noah Harari. Uh, but that idea 
is really, you know, the human brain is suffused with all of these biases that evolution uh, deemed to be fit, right, to, to create a more fit species. And so th those include everything from, uh, you know, uh, overestimating danger or a kind of in-group, out-group bias so that, that you know, you, you esteem those within your in-group and you derogate those in the out-group. And I think that those cognitive biases, if people were more aware of them and operated more consciousness of them, probably would do well, uh, much better than we are now, especially in non-PC subjects. But in the case of uh, the chatbots and, and just home, honing in on the idea of anthropomorphism, you know, I relied on Stuart Guthrie's work, and he's really a, he's, he stands in some ways, I would say, at the origin of the more sophisticated cognitive models of what religion is and where it comes from. And so his book, Faces, uh, Faces in the Clouds, he describes uh, anthropomorphism as a sort of cognitive tendency that uh, is necessary for human beings to identify salient things in the environment, right? So that your brain is primed before you were born, basically, right? Or by the genes, uh, your it's sitting there latent. And as you're developing, your brain has uh, pre-existing forms of human beings, right? They're very, very vague, but they, you're, it's, it's ready to capture the human form much more readily than it is a rock. And that's just the, the, the that them's the facts, right? And so it, he he points to all these other things, right? That uh, the human brain, and this is elaborated on by a, a, another scholar, Pascal Boyer, and many others. But that the human brain is also uh, prone to perceive danger, and so that danger will will be will register as being much more salient, and will tend to register as being some kind of agent, right? Some sort of conscious or sentient agent. And so, they, you know, uh, psychologists call this the hyperactive agency detection device in the brain. And so coupling those two ideas, and there's many others you could add to it, but coupling those two ideas, the idea that the human mind is primed to perceive uh, human form and also human language and so the human mind will always be projecting that out un subconsciously, right? And if it sees nothing, then it doesn't trigger. But if you look over and you look at a wall, for instance, and the cracks resemble a human face, boom, suddenly that anthropomorphic bias or instinct gets triggered. And the same thing with danger, right? Like, you know, if you're at all in anxiety about your situation, you hear a bump in the night, boom, your brain projects consciousness or conscious intent onto that noise, whatever it is. And so in the case of these chatbots, it's quite brilliant. I mean, I thought sex bots were brilliant, right? Like the way that they kind of fit into the the, the, the male predispositions that just you know want to get down. Uh, talk about crude in comparison. I mean, the chat bot, it, it, it's articulate, it's personable. Uh, you, you know, obviously you've asked it something you're interested in, so you're already primed to hear it. And so as it's coming at you, as these strings of, like you, you say, randomly supposedly randomly or uh, I guess statistically probable strings of words that are relevant to the question of emerge, you experience it unless you are autistic and mind blind or unless you are just already kind of jaded to it, you kind of experience it as a being coming at you. Now, I've only asked ChatGPT one question my entire life. I just want to say that I've never I've never downloaded it. I've never used it. I'd simply uh, apparently, I'm now on the war room. Uh, the, uh, the, book, the the mouthpiece for ChatGPT is I read other people's transcripts, but I've only asked it one question ever. I asked it through someone else's ChatGPT app. I asked it, "Does Elon Musk want to chip our brains?" And it came back, "No." And this is very, very early on, before the safety filters. No, Elon Musk does not want to chip our brains. Elon Musk believes in radical abundance, and he he believes technology can be used good, for the good of all mankind. And I'm like, okay, so it's lying, it's fucking, it's lying its face off at me here, right? And, you know, I just immediately dismissed it from there. But it still was, uh, you know, as I watched my, my friend ask it all these questions, ask it to write a song, ask it, you know, whatever, what's the price of eggs in China? As it's coming at him, he's just like, whoa! And, all, you know, this, this female is also there with it. She's like, oh my God, this, this is amazing. And I'm myself a little bit astounded i mean this song suck you know the songs are terrible but the, the, they're original enough most songs suck most poems suck okay so it's not like 
You know, it's very human <laughs> in that way. Most poems suck. Most dreams aren't interesting. And so, you know, that people use that as some kind of uh, standard for whether it's human or conscious. It's really lame because, you know, it's not, it's, it has a very human level of suck poetry. But you, you, you see their interaction and, and how shocking it is to them. And across the public, I think it's very clear that whatever's on the other end of it, whatever's on the machine end of it, whatever's on the spiritual end of it, whatever it is, the human mind is vulnerable to it. And, you know, I point out in the piece that, uh, you know, they knew uh, Purdue Pharma, when they produced OxyContin, they knew that OxyContin would slide right into the endorphin receptors, right? We're made for OxyContin. Um, it, you know, in the same way that smartphones really just slide right into the need for interaction and the need, and human curiosity and, 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 and human desire to be led somewhere, guided by something wiser. Uh, in the same way, social media likes just hammer on those dopamine, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the dopamine uh, reward uh, uh, module in the brain, just hammering it and just, you know, smashing. They knew that they could exploit these pre-existing kind of neurological tendencies in human beings. And I have no doubt in my mind with all of the cognitive scientists that are associated with open AI and Microsoft, and Google and all that, have no doubt in my mind that these people knew that that sort of anthropomorphic tendency or bias would be triggered and they knew that some number of people they'd be able to get them by the uh, groin so to speak and they did and they will and it will continue especially in children because it will kind of open up that uh, that human machine interface in the next generation as it's being used and already i hear all these professors making all these excuses for their students using it and proposing all these super lame excuses for why it should even exist like oh it'll help them uh, get sentence structure down, or oh, it'll it'll help students who have anxiety get the first draft down, and all that. It's like, dude, your job is to teach them how to do that and to motivate them to do it in and of their own accord. So, anyway, I, I'm, I'm clearly biased myself on this, but I'm I'm quite disgusted actually at the of the response from the educational establishment. A lot of teachers have voiced their concern, and I really appreciate it. A lot of them are continuing to to scream. From the top of their lungs that this is a bad development to incorporate into the educational system. But I think that as so many different forces have converged to make e-learning a normative model of education, this is just going to be one more tool. And I, in, in, in my opinion, uh, it, it will be a very detrimental tool, just like most of e-learning is detrimental. Hmm. Well, there was, now that you kind of... Um Approach that subject of you know the e-learning and, and everything and what all of these uh, uh, different tech companies are, are you know specifically designing it for hooking you in and drawing you in. Um, I I read just you know a couple of days ago that you know Facebook is now or Meta um, is n now developing their own you know version of. OpenAI, ChatGPT, and it's kind of hard to to get from from their press releases so far because there's been very little. However, it seems to me because at first I thought it was just going to be they're getting rid of their metaverse in order to focus on the the AI. But now what I'm thinking is actually more that they're going to be doing both at the same time, where they're going to continue developing the metaverse, but then bringing this OpenAI system into the metaverse which then the, well that terrifies me uh for sure because then you're talking about you know like you're like you're saying how this ai system latches on to one's need for interaction one one's need or desire for for being guided let's say not necessarily led but guided where then they can, they want, and that's what they want to do with their platforms. That's the whole point of the endless scrolling feature uh, of YouTube and Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff. It's to keep you in their ecosystem. Well, then this, this becomes the next iteration of that beyond anything else where you can, you can look at just Google as the search engine where it's a very rudimentary and crude version of this AI system, you know, you, you ask it questions and it gives you like relevant results. And then it's just kind of like, uh, is one step beyond that. Similarly, it seems to me that 
what they're trying to do is create this this digital longhouse where they draw everyone in and keep you there. What do you have? Uh, and you won't be able to tell if whoever uh, yeah. you're interacting with is a, well, it's the same now in like comment sections or on Twitter. You can't tell who, you can't necessarily tell right away who's a bot and who's not. But in the, in the metaverse, you're walking around and it's like, Maybe, is that a is, yeah, that, is that, that a hot chick is or that an, is that just an a NPC? <laughs> so what's what's you your? Know, I think the NPC. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, that delay makes it difficult. Sorry. Um, uh, the NPC observation is dead on. I mean, that's what these these are like Uber NPCs, right? These are uh, NPCs that will uh, certainly begin to suffuse, and they already do. I mean. NPCs were in many ways kind of the first chatbots, uh, among the first generation of chatbots. I mean, real quick, you, you guys may be familiar with this. You, you're familiar with Eliza, Joseph Weizenbaum's Eliza from MIT going back to the 60s. And yeah. what was incredible about that, I don't I won't know if that's the very first chatbot. It's the first really famous chatbot to my awareness. But mid-60s, you've got this guy creates a, just a really dull chatbot called Eliza that is based on Carl Rogers psychotherapeutic tendency to just simply ask questions based on whatever the response is. And that was enough to get people hooked. And after we, we reported on that, in the war room, all these people were messaging me and emailing me saying that, Oh, like older people are like, yeah, I had an Eliza on my Macintosh. Da, da, da. I'm like, wow, it was really that popular. So it has a long precedent, but anyway, to the point about the metaverse and meta in general, Something I noticed is really early on, uh, what's his name? Jan LeCun, I believe is how it's pronounced, uh, their chief AI scientist at Meta. And he is hating on chat GPT. He's like, oh, well, this is just another technology. Like we've, a lot of people have it, you know, da, 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 you know uh, uh, what, uh, the uh, generative pre-trained transformers aren't unique to uh, open AI. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, mm. well, you know, he is actually correct about it. But I'm like, kind of being a hater on that aren't you you know i mean but I, the more he kept saying it i started to expect man i bet he plans i bet they plan on rolling out something else and sure enough uh at least the first iteration of it they just announced it i only read it at um ars technica i believe just a couple of days ago i haven't really pursued it much but uh not yet but the uh but meta has at least announced that they have this super efficient uh a, a, large language model i don't even know if it's uh i don't know how you would categorize it because the interesting thing too about what yang lacoon was saying is that you can create chatbots that don't follow the large language model paradigm or framework and so i'm not even sure if it's accurate to call what they plan on doing a a, a large language model in that sense i mean it is i guess in, it'll reflect that but i'm guessing that it's coming at it from a different angle right um, we'll see, but they have something they're cooking up to jump into this AI arms race. And so you mix that with something like meta. I mean, you know, a lot of people have raised the alarm on the inevitability really of these chatbots as, as they become more democratized and more and more people are able to deploy them. And as governments and corporations deploy them for their own purposes, you're going to have an internet flooded with fake people, with NPCs. And as they become more sophisticated, you really will have a hard time telling who is and who isn't a bot. And people, as they become more and more predictable and roboticized, uh, you, you, you know, half the time, I'm very disappointed to find out it's a person. Uh, <laughs> because it's like, are you really that narrow and predictable? But uh, it, it, so you add to it that idea of the metaverse, which... A lot of people, I think, breathed a sigh of relief when Meta tanked, and they're like, oh, and, and virtual reality really hasn't had the uh, staying power that the people pushing it thought it would yet. But uh, I, I think that's also partly due to certain technical limitations. I don't get sick, or I haven't gotten sick. I've only tried it three times. I didn't get sick, but I was using the HTC Vive, which is a pretty sophisticated model, and it was at places that you pay, so it's like, you know, they have all this, the strongest, you know, like the, the best computers, so that there's no latency. But when the case of like Oculus, you know, they thought like, it, it, you know, there was a time, especially as people were still being locked down, you thought that everybody and their grandma was be sitting at home on their Oculus. And, you know, that was it. Like, you know, half of society would be lost to the metaverse in that sense. Didn't happen. Uh, the Oculus really isn't all that popular. 
the games or the programs and all that sort of stuff, they're, real, they're all pretty lame. They're about as lame as that that big. I think what really put the death nail in it was when Mark Zuckerberg rushed with that uh, with that, that, that the the, uh, the promo on it. You remember the that stupid and, uh, chat that, call like, with Douglas the floating Rushkoff. people in space? Oh yeah, and like this is amazing. This is great. <laughs> You're like, no, that is not amazing. That is not great. <laughs> and it was so funny because you know I played that a couple of times as uh, my uh, uh, cold open on the War Room, and uh, the first time we played it, dude. It comes back, you know, you play the video. And they, oh, this is amazing. We're in space. And uh, <laughs> it comes back to Bannon's face, and he's just staring at the camera. And you could just see the utter contempt and disgust in his eyes. It was so hilarious. Um, and that's how most people felt. Uh, you know, uh, the uh, tech writer, uh, Douglas Rushkoff, I think, put it best, where it's like everybody's a deep fake of themselves, you know? And a really, really badly rendered one at that. Uh, so... People breathe a sigh of relief. Oh, well, the metaverse is dead. Metaverse is gone. That's not even a thing. Virtual reality ain't going to happen. I would like to think so. But the metaverse itself, just as a concept, I mean, it's very, very, it goes way back before, uh, you know, Facebook changed their name to meta. That was just their way of planting their flag in that territory. And the, the, the sort of metaverse is actually still a thriving system of virtual goods and virtual interactions. And of course, if you add, if you, if you consider just traditional gaming with a bunch of dudes wasting their lives away, sitting there playing in virtual worlds, uh, now the metaverse is plenty active. It just hasn't yet moved to where the periphery is is canceled out, and you're now in the sort of presence mode of virtual reality. And I suspect that you know, in, in general, that you're, you're absolutely like this this idea that you have that, that, that the addition of highly sophisticated chatbots. Uh, to a, a, you know a virtual world of any sort, whether it's traditional video games or uh, whether it's this sort of wild west of the metaverse virtual realm, it just adds to the you know uh, for lack of better words this sort of hellish notion of what it will be, so that you are literally wandering around this this supposedly wondrous. Uh, but yet crude reflection of what heaven is supposed to be or what hells are supposed to be or what any of these sort of, you know, fantastic other worlds that the ancients have long experienced and dreamed. Um, you're wandering around this kind of crude rendition of it and you're encountering these beings and forming relationships with them and they're just bots. Uh, it's bad enough if you like call customer service and you have like a, a reasonably human sounding voice, like peppy California girl, like, Hey, what can I do for you? And you're like, Oh, Hey, how's it going? Yeah. And then you're really like, you're like, wait a second, you're a robot. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and I, and I think that, that, that like the, uh, virtual reality sort of experience really does like, especially the really, really good, like well rendered virtual reality, you know, it, it, it occupies all the same. You talk about like occupying cognitive biases and, and, and like psychological predispositions. Uh, it, when it's done really well, I mean, literally, your model of the, the real world is being replaced, at least the sensory model that you're constructing with all your senses is being replaced, quite literally. This is how they talk about it, you know, replaced with this virtual environment. And then now, you know, you add to the chat box, yeah, <clears throat> hell on Earth, my friend. We're hell <clears throat> just off of Earth, just like one step yeah. away from Earth. Uh, speaking of hell on Earth, um, I wanted to ask you your take, you know, in general on on kind of like the um the future and uh you know like the how, whether it's determined or w w what options there are because it seems to me that uh, many people have this kind of reasoning in their their minds that it's kind of like a necessary evolution right so there's basically just the way it goes it's a necessity and i mean this argument is always a bit strange because uh, you know why would you you know, ad advoc advocate for it, you know, if it's inevitable anyway, you know, it's the same thing that uh, the the social Darwinists faced, you know, these eugenicists and, and that kind of people, because their argument was, okay, um, uh, we, we need to kill the weaklings, right, to, to save the genes or whatever, but, uh, you know, but you guys claim it's a natural law, right, so it should happen anyway, why do you need to do anything, so it's kind of uh, that kind of contradiction, and I and, uh, was just interested um You know what? What you think and what your impression is? What what is the dominant like view about that? You know, is is it like to, is it generally thought that it's an in, 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 inevitable future? You know, the kind of cyborg AI thing, or are there different paths? You know, 
is is it at all thinkable to stop the the whole thing you know short of like a, a meteor hitting earth and just destroying every, everything um so yeah so so because that sounds pretty hellish right all all that and we can see it all around us you know so it, it is a bit dis disconcerting <laughs> Well, uh, one of the things that will drive, to the extent any of this is inevitable, uh, one thing that will drive its inevitability is the conviction on the part of many people that it sounds like heaven on earth to mm -hmm. them. And it then becomes a competition between worldviews playing out here in society and just on earth in general, in which those who simply want to maintain as much humanity as possible and perhaps even go back to kind of return Uh, ethos. Uh, there are those. Uh, there are many who just think that maybe we could just maybe we just hold put the brakes on here. That includes some transhumanists, by the way. Um, there are a number of transhumanists, especially in the sort of AI alignment community, that think that at least in the case of AI, we need to put the brakes on it now. Because if you can't control a large language model, what happens when you put a complex neural network in charge of something much more critical? Um, so anyway, th th this idea of the future and, and God help you if you rely on my predictions of the future. I mean, if you've ever seen my gambling record, it's absurd, uh, or my girlfriends or any of that, like, I, I mean, I'm not very good at predicting the future, uh, but I'm pretty good at looking at other people's predictions of the future and describing them. And so you have the sort of uh, just broadly speaking and within them, it's very, very, very diverse. But broadly speaking, you have this transhumanist uh, inclination, right? And that spans everything from those who would actually openly call themselves transhumanists uh, uh, to those that Yuval Noah Harari describes, right? Harari, as far as I know, has never uttered the word transhumanist or transhumanism or posthumanism. And if he has, it's very, very, very rare. In his book, Homo Deus, he basically just comes up with a new kind of pop coinage in which he sees two different paths that he's identified, um, one being techno-humanism, which is basically transhumanism, and another called dataism, which is basically post-humanism. And in the techno-humanist sort of set, and I think he, uh, Harari, by the way, people hate me for saying this all the time. I actually think that Harari is a brilliant and fantastic critic of these developments. He's so mercurial that it's very difficult to tell when he's excited about it or when he's uh, really you know, putting it down. And I think that he also has a real malevolence about him so that, that with that, that like, wicked little downturn grin of his, so that he's like warning you about this, but taking some kind of weird sadistic pleasure in doing so. Regardless of all that, I think that he is a very, very intelligent man with like a really well thought out and worthwhile view on what technology is and where it's going. So anyway, this, this transhumanist point of view, what he would call techno-humanism, you have people like wanting to maintain basic human structures, human values, maybe weed out a few things here and there, right? Weed out cancer, weed out zits, weed out ugly chicks, uh, weed out weak men, uh, that sort of thing, right? But basically, the, 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 the sort of human structure would remain, but enhanced. And Elon Musk, I would say, is pretty much in this school of thought, right? I'm not saying that he wants to eugenicize shrimpy dudes, but uh, I am saying that uh, certainly in his pro-natalist approach to life, there is uh, every bit of the sort of uh, underlying motivation of eugenics in it, right? Like, you know, he impregnates all these chicks so that there'll be more smart people on Earth, that sort of thing. Uh, very much a eugenics sort of program. And he's certainly not alone in that. There's a ton of these sort of techie pro-natalist types that also are basically soft eugenicists and so you still have the human maintained in that though right so the human is then just enhanced by artificial intelligence and the artificial intelligence could be a, you know the window to it could be a screen the window to it could be a robot or the window to that artificial intelligence or the access to it could be the chip in the brain that elon musk and, and many others are working on right so there's that or there's the uh post-humanist path which is a much it's much more minority right the appeal is only there i think for people who tend towards misanthropy uh or tend towards a sort of buddhist self-denial one or the other or maybe both and in that point of view the sort of dataist point of view as harari would call it but again he's just ripping off ideas he's borrowing ideas and applying a new pop coinage to it but in that point of view Really, we are just 
the what, what Musk would call the and he vacillates on this. Musk does, by the way, but we're we're just like the uh, front loaders for the uh, the the, the what, what, is, what is it called? I don't know. I'm not a programmer, um, but it's a, the, the the startup program for a greater program, which is basically electronic life, digital life. Uh, the physicist, the MIT uh, physicist Max Tegmark calls this life 3.0, right? So that you begin with human biology and it takes forever to evolve. And then you come to uh, pretty much the early hunter gatherers. And then you have cultural evolution, which really takes off with agriculture and really takes off with uh, industrial revolution. And so you have this like rapid increase in complexity uh, by way of the life 2.0 culture right? Cultural evolution operating on top of biological evolution in some sense, uh, having a kind of downward pressure on it or an impact on it. The, the tag mark then holds up uh, digital life, uh, artificial life, artificial intelligence, robots, that sort of thing. And he holds that up as a sort of third phase of life. And he offers all these different possibilities of what could happen but a few of them are, in essence, post-humanist, right? Ben Gertzel tends towards this. I would say that even though Ray Kurzweil's on the border, he, turn, he tends towards this. And it's the idea that these machines, once they have absorbed all that is of value in the human, once it has absorbed the best of our intellect, the best of our cultural productions, the best of our body type, right, in order to sort of uh, model its experience of the world, but also model the resulting robots. The idea then is that you would have pretty much a, a situation where, in which the human must just simply relinquish the ego or won't have a choice and will fall off like, like a, a caterpillar's cocoon and be left behind as the great butterfly of robots and, and uh, you know, artificial intelligence, you know, squirting out computronium like, like bird poo everywhere. Uh, which then lands and, and activates everything else and goes out into the galaxy to explore everything that, 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 that it's human, um, the, the sort of human larva wasn't able to. So those are two completely nightmarish and horrific ideas that there is a lot of actual passion behind, right? Especially the sort of techno-humanist or transhumanist point of view, the idea that we will just simply upgrade ourselves. And the idea too, and it's, it's openly articulated, it's openly articulated by some of the biggest names, Eric Schmidt, uh, Elon Musk, uh, I, I would say on a more subtle level, Jeff Bezos, uh, and certainly among the transhumanist thinkers, the idea is that enhanced humans will outperform and outcompete unenhanced humans. And unenhanced humans, legacy humans, Luddites, for all of their passion and all of their sentiment and all of their nostalgia, will just simply be left behind like the Neanderthals, right? It's just the way it is. Evolution will leave us behind. They may keep us around in zoos. They may keep us as pets or servants, but we won't have any say in it because if you are in command of vast artificial intelligence systems, and if you are in command of uh, you know war or like lethal autonomous drone swarms, or if you're just simply in command of uh, stock software that outperforms human beings, well, then the human being is now in irrelevancy. The only thing that matters, the only being at the ape, the only apex predator there will be on the planet will be those kinds of cyborg human beings. This is how they describe it. This is how they talk about it. This is and, and it's not someone say, oh, it's a conspiracy. I don't see a conspiracy. A conspiracy would be great because a conspiracy would mean you had like this small cabal of people. And more than likely, they would have a pentagram on the floor and they would have like potions boiling. And, they you know, they'd be doing spells and stuff like that. And you could like take your magic sword and kick through the door and lob off their heads. And then that's it. Conspiracy over problem solved. Nobody wants to be a cyborg anymore. Life goes on, but it's just a broad cultural tendency. It is so enmeshed through certainly American culture, corporate culture. It's, it's becoming much more part of the government. It's certainly part of the kind of cutting edge of our military culture. And that extends all the way over to Europe. You see it expressed openly at the world economic forum. And that really, they're just kind of mouthpieces for all the other much greater forces around them. I mean, everybody talks about Klaus Schwab, like he's going to, you know, try to take over the planet from the Swiss Alps or something. I mean, this guy is just literally looking around like, okay, these are the most powerful trends. This is what's happening. The fourth industrial revolution, the merging of the physical, digital and biological worlds, 
and you get it all the way across. India has taken it up with much gusto. Certainly, uh, China has taken it up with much gusto in their neighbor, Japan, and all throughout Asia. And Russia as well, Vladimir Putin famously saying that he who is at the forefront of AI, to paraphrase, will rule the world. This is a just it's a pervasive mentality. And so the way around it, like what happens to those of us who are nostalgic? What happens to those of us who want to remain human? Uh, what happens to those of us who would just like to see all of this go away? I think that um, there's a few different answers to that. Uh, and, I, and again, I would not offer a prediction on how it would turn out. But I think that um, more than likely, two things are going to occur. Yes, there will be certain advantages to the sort of upgraded humanity and for two reasons. One, because they will create the environment in which someone is or isn't adapted, which someone is or isn't fit. They're creating that ecosystem around us. And so fitness in that ecosystem, to some extent, is determined by just the reality of the powers of technology. But in many cases, it's because it's a technological system that they're overlaying over the society. And those who will be able to exist in it are those who adapt to it, right? So there's the possibility that various vulnerabilities will always exist in that system so that either it can be dismantled or at least avoided or at least pushed back. There's also, I think, the very good possibility that a lot of these sort of upgrades won't be as, uh, as effective outside of the sort of cultural milieu as they think it will be. Mm. And so that as they rely more and more on these digital technologies and become more and more like the kind of lamprey eels on its underbelly, that those number of human beings who continue to exert themselves in the world and continue to cultivate discipline and virtue within themselves, assuming that they're not wiped out genocidally, which, you know, again, that's fantasy land stuff, right? Hopefully, that they will, in fact, outcompete them. And to some extent, you know, we'll always have to adopt those technologies. You'd be a damn fool to go into war with somebody with, you know, a machine gun, with, you know, a knife, right? But at the same time, there will have to be, in order to maintain, I think, going forward in terms of the next 50 years or so, assuming nuclear war doesn't stop all of this, um, going forward, there will have to be a conscious, concerted effort to reject certain convenient and advantageous technologies. And I believe there will be plenty of people who want to do it. And because I'm one of those people, I simply hold faith that we're going to do well. And if I'm wrong, well, there's always the consolation of mystic religion to tell me that we'll do well in the next world. But I, I just assume, not for any intellectual reason whatsoever, I just assume because I'm me and because my people are my people, we're going to do well. Well, you, you already partially answered uh, what I thought would be my last question, Joe. Uh, one thought I had about uh, Elon Musk in particular in his warnings about AI and his implementation of uh, Neuralink, you know, he thought that uh, Neuralink would be a way for human beings to mitigate the dangers of AI by uh, acting pretty much directly with computers. Um, and he seems to leave out the vulnerability of human beings to, in this uh, bi-directional communication, uh, be left open and vulnerable to the uh, the the machinations of computers and AI. Um, but uh, w what you were just saying was uh, was pretty much uh, what I wanted to ask you uh, in the end, and that is just uh, because I I know on a very rudimentary level I am overwhelmed in a sense by the algorithms of of YouTube and the, you know, and the, and the videos that come up that are sometimes miraculously, gee, did I say that in another room and my phone picked it up or my computer picked it up and found this obscure video that was an answer to a question I had. Or uh, I didn't even know I wanted to or see I it. I didn't even know. I mean, just, just fascinating in, in the way that it, it is almost telepathic in its, in its, uh, ability to provide information or entertainment that uh, would suck me in further to this um, uh, to this to this other uh, you know realm if you will and um, you know I, I love what you said about uh, you know uh, you know you and yours and 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 remaining true to uh, you know legacy humanity and and I'm paraphrasing, of course. Uh, you said it much more eloquently, um, but there there is a cognitive uh, level of warfare that seems to be involved in 
uh, that we're that we're seeing and that we uh, would do well to be aware of and um, and help us to uh, become more self-aware and and how we interact with these things. I haven't yet uh, used any of these Chat GPTs. Uh, uh, programs or uh, or even the art program that that it seems so cool and something that I, I'm quite tempted to mess around with um, but I, I wonder if as a as a closing note here uh, how we might think of this on an individual level uh, as we go forward how might we um, uh, how what what attitude or approach might we take to all of these really cool technologies um, that that might help us to not get sucked in further more than we already are with our computers and the media and and our phones and and all of these things that would seem to make life extra cool uh if you would and 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 more stimulated uh, you know I'm, I'm probably a worse source for advice than I am for predictions of the future. Uh, <laughs> again, see my gambling record and my, my uh, girlfriends. Um, but I, um, I will say this, that I, I think that the most immediate thing, what, what I see in all this is that in many ways, it is a, a tremendous distraction from what's most important in human life. I wouldn't be paying attention to it if I didn't think that we were at a point where the impact it's having now will have tremendous consequences downstream. So it has to be addressed and it's a way for me to do my own little part to hopefully nudge it in a certain direction for certain people. Uh, but I, I really think that by and large, especially in the case of like, you mentioned like Dolly uh, to the, uh, the image generator. Yeah. And of course there's even better ones now, like uh, stable diffusion mid journey, I think is the most sophisticated. Um, I guess Google's imagine is pretty goofy, but I think that really what we're seeing I would think of it, this is how I think of it, really. And it's not dissimilar to how Max, Max Tegmark thinks of it. I just think of it from the other side of that, is that we are seeing the kind of speciation of humanity. And in the same sort of way that, you know, many tens of thousands of years ago, uh, the races began to branch off and become... Uh, the sort of European stock or the African stock or the Asian stock, generally speaking, a continental level, and then all the other little subcategories. I mean, we're going to see that in much more rapid fashion, though, and we're going to see it consciously. We're going to do it consciously. And this is certainly not original to me, right? These guys speak about this all the time. It's a sort of new race of humanity, what Harari calls Homo Deus, right? And I think that that's a reality. And I think that if you do not want to put your bloodline or your cultural contributions, for that matter, into that stream, you will have to make a conscious decision not to do so unless you just happen to find yourself in a you know, kind of uninhabited area of the world or undeveloped area of the world, in which case you might really be concerned about how your bloodline is going to survive at all. But at least you want to worry about that. But that's what I see. And I see those of us who want to resist it and would like to be part of the more naturalistic stream. And that's one part of it, right? I think there's many atheist naturalists who feel this way, that even, you know, the purely materialist, purely naturalist, but that technology represents a danger to all of those biological structures and forms and functions that took evolution over really three and a half billion years to create. But, you know, in the case of humans, a quarter million years to create, right? And the technology risks blowing all of that. There's them. And I think that they are an important part of this. But uh, I'm much more inclined towards those of the traditional mindset that there is the, the human being, the human form represents something divine, maybe in a gross form. And we're here for various reasons, depending on who you're asking at any given time. But those traditionalists who see technology as being, as it's described, I think, again, quite eloquently by Yuval Noah Harari, and I would say also quite neutrally by Yuval Noah Harari and critically, but the rise of these techno religions and either the co-op, they, they're either going to co-opt traditional religion and turn them into something else, like that, that horrific Baptist church that you went to that has you know, like people flying around with laser beams shooting out of their eyes or whatever, <laughs> uh, or, 
uh, it, you know, they're just simply going to replace it entirely with something else. And so, and that's something that I found a lot coming out of the cognitive and evolutionary study of religion is that these people see the importance of religious structure, the old religious structure. And they want to take it as an abstraction and create a new sort of materialist religion or new varieties of materialist religions. And that's exactly what they're doing. And so for those who are in the naturalist camp or in the religious traditionalist camp or whatever sort of crossover between, I think that going forward, you just have to see this stuff as quite literally poison. And it may be poison you have to imbibe on occasion and build up an immunity to, but it is spiritual poison. It is a, it is a contaminant in the environment, both mentally and physically and socially. And so really the, the biggest thing to do my mind is to focus forward on what we want, how we're going to live in the coming decades. And then to the extent we can even think about it, the coming centuries, either outside of the system or in the shadow of the system or underneath the system, how are we going to live? Identify those values and those goals and identify them in, you know, against over and against that system, which is coalescing around us. And also to recognize that that system is not monolithic. There are many, many subsystems in it. And they're all in competition with one another, such as, for instance, uh, the uh, U.S. deep state and Russia. And they could end it all just like that, right? And, you know, whatever survives of legacy humanity, is, we don't have to worry about the cyborgs anymore, at least. But that's how I see it. I really do think, and it is. It's been described as a sort of race war uh, by uh, really Hugo de Garris. I think, is, you know, he doesn't say race war. That's what he's talking about. And I don't, and, and also um, Zoltan Istvan, the former uh, or the, the one time uh, presidential candidate for the transhumanist party, he describes it in these terms and other lesser known figures do too. And so like I, race war is a charged term and I, and I don't want to see it. And war is a charged term. I don't even know if that's the right way of thinking about it. But certainly the idea of species competition, I think, will become more important. It doesn't seem important now. It doesn't look important now. I believe that the transhumanists and the kind of techno futurists are absolutely correct. It will be important going forward. And so if your cultural progeny or your biological progeny are going to exist outside of it, they need to think of it in terms of that sort of competition and potential conflict. Hmm. Well, yeah, that's you know, very interesting just uh, uh, to riff on that just uh, for a second, because um, uh, we can see that already today in a sense, right? I mean, um, if you're not like super computer savvy and you really um, are super good at, at, you know, like computing stuff uh, for which you need to spend loads of time on the computer, right? And on the net, um, then it's it's getting hard and hard to make any sort of living, right? So, I mean, that might be kind of like the, the beginning of that sort of thing. Uh, and soon, you know, you if you're not immersed, you know, the whole day in that stuff uh, will be hard, you know, to, I mean, just get by. I don't know. A hundred percent. It's the first it's the first step. And I think a long kind of separation. Uh, and it's a separation which has happened before, by the way, uh, on a large scale. It's happened many times. But I think the, the separation of agricultural society out of the hunter gatherer societies. And, you know, when, let's say, uh, Sumer or Babylon were founded. They were literally just these tiny seeds of civilization, right? Like the, everyone else was that most horticulturalist, but mostly hunter gatherer. But in a very, very short span of time, you saw the explosion of civilization in that cultural mode, right? A cultural genocide of those who existed as hunter gatherers. And I, you know, my right wing friends might give me hell over this, but I really don't care. I have tremendous sympathy for hunter gatherers. And a tremendous sympathy for that way of life. Yeah, I know parasites. You know, no, I don't want a tapeworm that wraps around my torso. No, I, yeah, I like having teeth and all that. Okay, got it. But I think that um, in general, what happened was a tremendous loss of, of not only just a way of life, but a way of experiencing reality. And uh, it, 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 uh, certainly a sort of a, a synchronization or a harmony with nature. I know, yeah, I know Anasazi Indians, deforested, all that. Got it. But, and I'm not talking to you guys, obviously, just anybody who might listen to this and give me hell about it. But um, 
I, I think that it was worth preserving. And I think if we had been wiser in our past, uh, it may have been a bit paternalistic, but I, I think that what we now are like, people are now scrambling to preserve these cultures and preserve those languages and preserve those life ways and preserve areas for them, like say in the Amazon, um, we would have been wiser just to have had less of a footprint to begin with. And what we're seeing now is just that, but much more rapid. But fortunately, at least anybody with any damn sense knows that if they want, if, as now we industrial human beings confronted by the next wave of transhuman or kind of cyborg era human beings, we at least have the ability to consciously assess what our strengths are, what is worth preserving in us, articulate it. And there are actually reasonable people on the other end. And if it can't be negotiated, then yeah, you have to either escape or confront. Um, but yes, if you don't, if you don't have a phone, if you don't have a smartphone, good luck. And it, it, the possibility is held out there. I mean, Klaus Schwab talks about this. A lot of people talk about this. Christians have been talking about it for too long. Now, nobody takes it seriously. But fundamentalist Christians, I mean, always talking about the chip, right? The hand chip, the implant, right? I don't know how imminent something like that is, but I do know that you don't need a, a chip in your hand if, if you keep your phone there voluntarily. And you don't need uh, you know, a, a chip in your brain if, if most of your consciousness is fed to you digitally. And you don't, so, so we're already like, you know, Musk talks about this, we're already kind of at that point. So I have a tremendous sympathy for the kind of traditionalist return crowd who says that, you know, we just have to simply find ways of rejecting this and then and, and going back to more um, just ancient life ways and ancient ways of seeing the world. But yeah, anyway, that was a long way of saying absolutely this issue of the, the, the digital ecosystem that's being built around us and us not being fit on an evolutionary level to exist or thrive to it. And we must adapt, not genetically speaking, but culturally speaking, we must adapt our mimetic gene code, you could say, to it, or we will be left behind and we will not be able to survive it. It's a huge problem. And it's one, again, uh, I'm not a good source of advice. I, I'm more of a uh, trash talker, but I do, um, I, I, I have tremendous hope for those of us who at least want to winnow away that, that aspect of the technological genetic or technological mimetic code that is in our minds and in our cultures. And uh, mainly my justification for that, again, uh, just to, to end it off, my only justification is aesthetic. And it's because these are my people. This is how I uh, was raised. These are the values that I find myself with, whether they're innate or whether they were given to me. And I think they're worth fighting for. Well, I think that's a, a great place to end it right there, Joe. I did want to ask you, do you have a working title for the book you're working on? or, or? Well, I'm going to keep it close for ju just for now. Just for now. I'm almost okay. there, but keeping it close just for now. I, I appreciate well, you asking, though. I, I'd, I'd love to tell you now, but I don't, I don't think you're talking. Not quite yet. <laughs> well, when it comes out, we'll have you on again. And in the meantime, folks, you can... I'd love uh, to. You it's fantastic. It, we we enjoyed speaking to you uh, greatly. I mean, uh, you 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 spoke with a, a lot of uh, depth and insight on these matters. I think it's a subject we haven't really gotten into on in the show uh, before. And uh, what better way to inaugurate uh, delving into the subject matter than with you? And I just want to remind viewers that um, uh, Joe's excellent Substack is called Singularity Weekly. We'll link to it in the show description. And uh, thanks, man. We, we look forward to talking to you again. Uh, this was a great discussion. Absolutely. Uh, fantastic. And, and by the way, uh, I don't grudge you at all for the, uh, for the Dan jailbreak into the woo-woo areas. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I quite appreciate it. I'm glad you guys yeah, had the guts to, 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 to step with your woo foot forward. Yeah. <laughs> there was more in that direction, I'm too. sure, but we'll save that for another show, I think. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks, Joe. That was great. Thank you very much. God yeah. bless. Thank you. Very much appreciated. Thank you.